Hi, everybody. We're about to watch a film. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, thank you for, to everyone at Soil Not Oil, uh, Miguel Robles, especially for inviting me today. Uh, I'm a filmmaker for an organization called Kiss the Ground. Our mission is to inspire participation in global regeneration, starting with soil. So we work with, we create content, but we also work with farmers, helping them transition into regenerative agriculture and with advocates training them to speak about soil. But today, uh, because I'm showing this film, I wanted to talk a little bit about the global aspect of our mission. You know, uh, I was born 30 years ago in Argentina and growing up, I've come to notice how the interconnectedness we're, we're experiencing through technology nowadays is, is nothing but a reflection of our natural world. And this goes for us humans as well, right? I, when I came to this country, I was hoping to shield myself from perpetual economic crisis and lack of opportunities and all of this. And even though, you know, I love living here and having a great time and I don't want to go back, I, I can't help but notice that even though I can be doing good, if not all of us are doing good, no one's fine. You know, we're, we're all connected, right? So this was a bit of the inspiration to start producing these films. It's a small series of films uh, directed to the Latin American audience of farmers who need this information so much. When I'm speaking here in front of all of you, I know you, you get me when I speak about carbon sequestration and you know, global warming and all of this stuff, but a lot of people that don't have the resources to inform themselves don't know that there's an opportunity in Region Ag. So this particular film is the first one of this series, as I, as I said, and it was filmed 100 miles south of my hometown in Cordoba, Argentina. Uh, it tells a story that strives to empower farmers to stop being victimized by a, by, a, by a food system that doesn't serve anyone. It doesn't serve them there because they can't make money or us here because it, it, it helps global warming and all this shit that we don't want anymore. Excuse my language. Uh, anyways, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, and if anyone wants to talk after. My name is Guido Lois. Yeah. Thank you so much. Entonces, ¿qué es el mate? El mate es una empresa familiar que produce carne de bovinos, de ovinos, de pollo y huevos bajo un manejo holístico de los recursos. Nuestra misión es generar alimentos sanos en un ambiente sustentable, generando impacto social, ambiental y económico. Una empresa con propósito. Por eso nuestra misión, además de producir, es divulgar esto para que más productores se sumen, haciendo capacitaciones y dando conferencias. El campo de Bruno funciona así. A las vacas le siguen las gallinas. También tiene ovejas, pollos y producen miel. Cada elemento de ese sistema potencia la eficiencia del otro. Y además ayuda a la economía de la granja, porque su negocio ya no depende solo del precio del mercado de un producto. Nosotros empezamos por necesidad, porque con el sistema industrial sentíamos que la empresa iba a quebrar. Entonces fue el motivador para decir o cambiamos o quebramos. Ahora te voy a presentar a Federico, que fue un poco el motor del cambio y que es mi viejo. Bueno, Federico, ¿cómo estás? Gracias ¿Cómo estás? por recibirme. No, gracias a vos por venir. Es un gusto recibirte. ¿Qué significa para vos este cambio de paradigma? Mira, esto además de un cambio de paradigmas, eh... Para mí significa un cambio de vida también y significa haber vuelto a empezar como productor en un mundo totalmente distinto al que habíamos, a lo que habíamos hecho toda la vida. Eh, esto nos ha generado un montón de satisfacciones y además de satisfacciones eh, nos ha dado un poco la posibilidad de reinsertar a nuestros hijos y a las generaciones que siguen 
dentro del terreno rural. Los novillos son una de las claves de su negocio. Sí, son la clave y es la parte principal de ingresos de la empresa. Le acabamos de abrir la puerta. ¿Por qué los hacen? ¿Por qué las mueven? Acabamos de mover porque este sistema se trata de imitar a cómo en la naturaleza pastorean los herbívoros. Las grandes manadas de herbívoros en la naturaleza pastorean en grandes grupos compactos por un momento muy corto y luego se mueven a un nuevo lugar. Así lo hacían por la presencia de los depredadores. Como hoy en día no, ya ten no tenemos ya el depredador, imitamos ese movimiento gracias al alambre eléctrico que nos permite tener grupos compactos e ir moviéndolo diariamente. Genial, la lluvia me hace pensar, eh, ¿tu suelo tiene mayor absorción? Mayor absorción y es por algo muy clave, es que cada vez que el animal consume el pasto hasta abajo, las raíces se mueren un 70-80% y todo este carbono, cada vez que la raíz se muere, queda acumulado en el suelo. Las pasturas y los pastizales son los grandes sumideros de carbono del mundo y mientras más carbono tenga un suelo, más agua almacena. ¿Este sistema de producción entonces puede ser una posible solución al calentamiento global? Es una de las únicas soluciones para fijar el carbono que anda dando vuelta y que sobra en la atmósfera. Si vos ves muchas de las soluciones de hoy en día hablan de cómo reducir las emisiones, pero pocas hablan de cómo capturar el carbono que hay dando vuelta y que está en exceso. Y la respuesta está en esto, ¿no? en el pastoreo bien gestionado con bovinos y rumiantes. El ciclo del carbono funciona así. Las plantas, en conjunto con el sol y el agua, realizan la fotosíntesis. Absorben carbono del aire y lo transforman en carbohidratos, azúcares. Luego bombean parte de esos azúcares para alimentar a los microorganismos que usan ese carbono para generar el suelo. Sin este ciclo no tendríamos agricultura. El gallinero se mueve cada cinco, cada siete días a un lugar nuevo. Entonces, una vez que las gallinas escarban, buscan pastorear un sector, cuando se termina el pasto en ese lugar, el, la casilla se cierra por la noche y las gallinas se mudan a la mañana a un lugar nuevo. ¿Y al hacer eso le ofrecen un servicio al suelo? Un servicio ecosistémico importantísimo porque la gallina con las garras escarba genera una perturbación estratégica que incita a expresar a muchas eh, plantas nativas a germinar además de airear el suelo y mejorar la infiltración. Un círculo virtuoso perfecto. Es un círculo virtuoso donde cada parte eh, genera sinergia. ¿Y este sistema es más rentable? Es más rentable porque permite ver sus sistemas en confinamiento de gallinas en jaula para el productor reducir un 50-40% el consumo de alimentos. Porque la gallina no solamente come eso, sino que está pastoreando y buscando insectos para complementar su dieta natural. Entonces, suelo sano, plantas sanas, gallinas felices. ¿Y cómo es el producto? El producto es de una alta calidad biológica. Este producto, para el que lo consume, no solamente va a estar consumiendo un huevo de alta calidad organoléptica, sino que también todo lo bueno del suelo y de la planta se transfiere a ese producto. Vamos a abrir los, los nidos donde ellas están poniendo y fíjate acá está el, el resultado final. ¿Y qué diferencia tiene este producto con uno de un sistema tradicional? Tiene no solamente un contenido de ácidos grasos y de, y de vitaminas muy, mucho más balanceado y mejor, sino que además es un huevo muy demandado por todo el rubro gastronómico, pastelero y de panaderías. ¿Por qué? Porque tiene una alta densidad. Fíjate vos lo espeso que es, ¿no? Y fíjate el color de la yema. Fíjate cuando lo, lo tocas que no se rompe. Increíble Yo siempre, el color. Siempre lo que le comento a los consumidores, cuando una persona está enferma, se pone pálida. El huevo es lo mismo. Un huevo producido en jaula es muy pálido porque no es sano. Este huevo es denso y bien amarillo porque es un huevo muy saludable. Dentro de la misma superficie donde se desarrollan todas las otras actividades, también se hace actividad apícola. Entonces se produce miel. Y la abeja no solamente nos da este valioso producto, sino que tiene funciones muy importantes en el ecosistema. ¿Y tiene buen rendimiento estas colmenas? El rendimiento es buenísimo, es hasta el doble o el triple que colmenas que están puestas sobre sistemas convencionales, porque acá no se aplican insecticidas, que es la que a ellas las mata de manera muy fácil. Acá ellas pueden comer y hacer todo su trabajo tranquila sin que estén afectadas por insumos químicos. O sea que desde el campo también se puede decir que están ofreciendo un servicio de 
polinizadores para la zona. Exactamente, y hoy hay muchos lugares del mundo donde las frutas no se producen por falta de abejas. Y acá fíjate cómo la, la abeja cumple un rol conectando ¿no? diferentes actores y plantas del sistema. A nosotros nos cambió la vida como productores, nos dio la, la posibilidad de ser libres económicamente, eh, cosa que antes no teníamos esa sensación. Eh, antes teníamos siempre esa sensación de ahogo, de presión financiera y, y de estar siempre al borde del abismo. Creo que es la, la situación de la mayoría de los productores eh, que dependiendo de, de cualquier variable pasan de ser eficientes a no eficientes o de ganar dinero a no ganar dinero. En estos sistemas productivos que se desacoplan de los insumos y, y que todo lo que se genera se genera tranqueras adentro, eh, se, se llega a lo que se llama la libertad financiera y eso no tiene precio. Hi, uh, my name is Rafi Leuterman, and I have the, um, the good fortune to work as content editor at Dr. Bronner's. And uh, so I want to talk a little, I'm, we're gonna, I'm gonna show a, a film about one of our projects uh, in India, or a project that we're heavily involved with, I should say. And uh, I, in, in introduction, I'll talk a little bit about what Dr. Bronner's is doing on the soil front, uh, our kind of position and, 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 and what we're working on. So um, the current generation of the Bronner family, when they took over the company, uh, David and Michael Bronner, um, they realized that they needed to really uh, be able to stand by the supply chain, all the ingredients that go into the soap. And so uh, that was the beginning of a comprehensive project first to go organic and then to go fair trade. And when they couldn't find uh, fair trade organic sources for the ingredients that they needed the most, um, they decided to start their own projects uh, to, to, to have these ingredients. Um, so, you know, the major ingredients that the company uses are coconut oil, uh, co uh, palm oil, Um, and as this video shows, mint oil, uh, peppermint soap is the flagship product, and we, uh, we use a lot of mint oil. Um, and we've also partnered, uh, so, so basically we started our own project for coconut oil in Sri Lanka, now have a second one in Samoa, um, and, um, and then also started a project for palm oil in Ghana. Um, and um, so, Yeah, initially these project and, and, and then this one is a, a mint project in India. Um, we've also partnered with other fair trade organic projects like uh, Canaan Fair Trade for olive oil uh, in Palestine. Um, and so, you know, as part of this process, you know, keep learning and, um, and realize that, of course, organic is not enough, right? We, we, um, We, we really have to take, as you all know <laughs> and have been hearing, um, we have to uh, take care of the soil. So um, this really began a project to uh, go regenerative organic on all projects, uh, on all our ingredients, as many as possible. And um, so, um, you know, because these ingredients are farmed in different parts of the world, what that means looks different in each place. Um, coconut and palm are, of course, tropical oils. Um, so for palm oil, uh, we're looking at um, a dynamic agroforestry systems um, as really the next big thing for us um, and trying to implement that a, as widely as possible in our palm oil project. Uh, for coconut oil in Sri Lanka and, Gan and uh, Samoa, um, just a lot of, uh, you know, um, intercropping, um, mixed grazing systems, um, uh, swales, mulching, 
composting. Um, and um, mint is uh, more, you know, grown in more temperate climate. Um, it's, a, uh, it's grown as an uh, annual. Um, so, um, you know, there we're looking at uh, rotational, rota you know, rotational farming, uh, a mixed crop system, um, also, uh, as you'll see, uh, a lot of composting, mulching, et cetera. Um, we're also doing a lot of work on the certification front. Um, you know, Dr. Bronner's, we, we, we believe very much uh, in, 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 in holding ourselves and other corporations accountable, uh, you know, because basically anything, any, any, any of these terms that can be used to greenwash a product and market it without having to do the actual work, a company will do that. You know, if they can get away with saying it's organic without really being organic, they will do that. And we went to court to fight that. Um, and uh, if they can get away with saying it's fair trade without actually doing the work of making sure it's fair trade, they will do that. So, we're, you know, we're obviously concerned that the same is going to happen in the regenerative space. Um, so we've partnered with other allies, um, notably Rodale, Patagonia, um, to do the regenerative organic certification. And we're saying organic is a baseline. It's just, you know, just at, at a bare minimum, you have to start with organic. Uh, no spraying um, and uh, no uh, chemical fertilizers. And, and then, of course, you have to build on that. And so as part of the regenerative organic certification, there's three pillars, soil health, um, there's uh, animal welfare, uh, and there's uh, fair labor practices. Um, whether it's, you know, working internationally through trade or domestically as well. So um, I think that's about all I have to say. This is, um, this is uh, about Pavitra Mentha, uh, a project that uh, we're, we work closely with in India and are really excited about all the work that they're doing to implement. Oh, I guess one last thing I want to say is that, you know, one thing that experience has taught us in terms of doing these projects, we work almost exclusively with smallholder farmers. And for this to spread, it, it has to work for the smallholder farmer. It has to mean they make more money and it has to uh, improve their lives measurably to do this. Otherwise, you know, you know, for I, I think, you know, for them, uh, you know, a lot of the things that we care about are are, are sort of theoretical. Uh, they need to see that it that it works for them in their daily lives, and and this stuff does. It 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 not only um, you know means more money for them because they can produce more on less land, um, but it also, um, as has been discussed here, builds climate resilience. And a lot of these smallholder farmers are on the front lines of, of the coming ca climate catastrophe. And so building their ability uh, to, to withstand uh, the, the more extreme events is, is going to be huge. And they're seeing that, and they understand that. So without further ado, um, and I'll be around if anyone has questions later. Everything we consume, whether it's food or soap or clothes or a radio, everything has a human labor component. And was that labor, was that human person who produced it, were they respected or were they exploited? Mint is obviously our most famous scent. It's Dr. Bronner's favorite soap. It's our original soap. And we want to produce our soaps in a way that every farmer and every worker involved is respected and being paid a fair price so that they can support their families and send their kids to school. उसी मुझे अनुभव होती है जब मैं मेंथा के खेत पे जाता हूँ मैं उसके साथ रहता हूँ तो मुझे बहुत अच्छा लगता है उसकी ठंडक उसकी खुशबू मिंट की खुशबू से थकते नहीं है बचपन से मिंट कर रहे हैं तो उसमें थोड़ी आदत सी हो गई है there wouldn't be a Dr. Bronner soap company today if it wasn't for our peppermint soap. And there wouldn't be peppermint soap if it wasn't for our partners in India making the organic peppermint oil that goes into it. A 
about 15 years ago when we decided that we wanted to know where our ingredients come from to go direct for mint. India was the natural option for us. It's been a major producer of mint for a long time. When I smell the peppermint soap, it brings me back to my childhood, going to visit my grandfather, who always seemed to have the smell of peppermint radiating from his pores. He started making peppermint soap in small batches at home. I think he really wanted to make something that would be more than a soap, but also a sensory experience. I mean, it's a very evocative scent for me personally. It just reminds me of my granddad and his life. Mint has always been our best seller. It's really what people identify with when they think of Dr. Bronner's. We sell a bottle of peppermint soap every 10 seconds. It accounts for one eighth of all natural soap sold in America. No amount of that hippie Dr. Bronner's soap can wash off. My grandfather put his philosophy on the bottle of soap. And what this generation is doing is taking that message off the bottle and applying it wherever we can. We're in Bareilly in Uttar Pradesh, northern India. Dr. Bronner's has been sourcing mint oils in this area since 2003. Over the years that we've worked here, we realized that one of the key challenges that farmers are facing is the deterioration in the quality of their soil. We have tested it, we have seen that the organic matter has gone below the low level of the soil. The result of industrial agriculture has been a global catastrophe of our agricultural landscape. The natural ecosystems are just destroyed. Carbon is oxidized up into the air. So it's a massive contributor of greenhouse gas, both in the effect of how it's ripping fertility out of our soils, but also the chemicals themselves have massive energy footprints. This is also a reason why if we use chemicals, then it will be like that the field is our field, it will be closed to something. So regenerative organic agriculture is about reversing all that disaster. And it's a strategy that mimics nature, farming in nature's image. And when you look at a natural ecosystem, there's no external chemical inputs, no synthetic fertilizers, no pesticides. It's a totally self-regenerating system. The key practices that farmers are using to regenerate the soil and bring back the carbon that has been lost to the atmosphere are simple. It's the production and application of compost. It's the use of mulches. That's crop residues that are just left on the fields. It's the shift to conservation tillage practices. They do not go as deep and are not as destructive. It's the use of cover crops, so soil does not go uncovered in between crops. And it's rotational crops that bring back nitrogen to the soil. और जो जैविक खाद हमने जब से तैयार करी है, जैविक खाद जब से लगाई है, तब हमें एक तो दो फायदा है, एक तो बीमारी से फायदा, वे दवाई में हमारा पैसा कम खर्च हो तो और लगाई तो भी कम है हमारी Soil is a living ecosystem, it's incredibly complex, and healthy crops and healthy food and amazing min oil is a byproduct of really healthy living soil. Depleted, mismanaged soil is like uh, a clear-cut forest, and when you properly manage soils, you bring that soil back to life, it's like reforestation. The importance of sourcing mint in an organic and regenerative fashion is that it supports such a huge land base and a huge number of farmers. So, before we had four people here, now we have 1,500 people who are growing further. We don't really differentiate so much between regenerative, organic and fair trade. To us, it's all one. What we're looking for in a fair trade partner is a similar set of ideals. We're looking for trust and integrity. The way we approach money is as energy to create a better world. And we want to make sure our local partners have that same philosophy. And Nihal and the team he has, they're just the ideal partner for us. They're excited by regenerative organic, excited like we are to be a steward of the land and just figuring out what are the best practices and techniques. What's different under fair trade is the individual farmer will receive a 10% organic premium over that market rate and another 10% which then goes into a community fund and that money can then be spent on various things, whether it's health, whether it's clean water. Those things are decided on by the committee here. Our Fair Trade Committee is what we can do better for society. We take our own thoughts and prioritize it and take the committee to the committee. In our villages and villages, the Fair Trade की तरफ से जो पंप वगैरह लगाए गए हैं, उससे हम लोगों के लिए बहुत ज़्यादा फायदा है। हम बीमार नहीं होते हैं, हमें साफ़ सुथरा पानी मिलता है, 
मेरी सबसे पसंदीदा चीज पवित्र मैंथा के लिए ये है कि एक तो ये जो सामाजिक स्तर को बढ़ाने के लिए जो कार्य करते हैं पवित्र मैंथा पुरुष किसानों के साथ साथ महिला किसानों को भी सपोर्ट करता है Fair trade for us provides an opportunity for our customers to use their dollars to make real differences in communities around the world. Dr. Bruno's team ne mujhko pura support kiya iske liye. Mere liye garv ki baat ye hai ki main us company ke sath mein kaam kar raha hu jo hai environment, community aur in sab ke development ke liye. मैं चाहता हूं कि जो मेरे पिताजी ने जमीन मुझे दी है मैं उसे बहुत अच्छी तरीके से अपने बच्चों को पीढ़ी दर पीढ़ी जो हमें मिली है हम किसी दूसरे को उसे बेहतर बना के दे सकें ऑल ऑफ आर इंग्रेडिएंट्स हैव अ स्टोरी एज़ फार एज़ वेयर इन द वर्ल्ड दे आर कमिंग फ्रॉम एंड इट्स रियली इंपॉर्टेंट टू अस टू मेक श्योर दैट आवर रॉ मटेरियल्स वी नो हुज प्रोड्यूसिंग देम वी आर इन अ फेयर लॉन्ग टर्म रिलेशनशिप विद देम द वे दे आर बीइंग ग्रोन इज रीजेनरेटिव एंड रिस्पेक्ट्स द सोइल रिवॉर्ड्स फार्मर्स मेक श्योर दैट एवरीवनस विनिंग That's our commitment. हम सब के रहते हैं और हम सबको मिलके ही साथ इसको सही करना पड़ेगा इसको सही करने का अभी एकमात्र साधन ही ऑर्गेनिक रिजनरेटिव एग्रीकल्चर है We have the solution. Like we we can stop being part of the problem and part of the solution. Hey everybody. Thank you all for coming. I'm so excited to be here hearing all these wonderful solutions all day. Um I'd like to just start by showing the film then talking a little bit afterwards. So, enjoy. The commons are those resources that are shared in common. The air we breathe, the water we drink. The closures are a process by which uh, corporations, market forces, often in collusion with government, commodify and privatize things that belong to all of us. There, if you want to use a different one besides closure, how about theft? There's a balance between private property and commons property, and the balance has gotten way too much in the direction of private property. We've allowed oil companies and coal companies to use the atmosphere as a free, open sewer, and that's why they're the most profitable industry on earth. The whole fight over global warming is essentially a fight to make the atmosphere a public space, not a private one. That's what this fight is about. 2014 officially marks the end of net neutrality as we know it. The fight for internet freedom becomes very real and present for many Americans. Without even basic information and data available for everyone we're really limited in the kinds of solutions that we can come up with the human spirit has to rebel it has to assert its own imperatives and i think that's what's happening uh, in the commons movement as well it's like no let's reorder our institutional relationships and policies to serve us instead of us fit into boxes as consumers and wage slaves for a system that is destroying the planet There's been this lack of care that's been created. Corporations can have policies that are destroying the earth, polluting our waters, and they don't care. This like I don't care mentality is being erased here. This is the resurrection of care. People are caring about each other. People are caring about the issues facing our world and our future. Community is becoming more and more important across the country. I think the uh, Occupy highlighted that and, and really gave a boost to that movement. to concentrate funding versus spending your money with the national corporations for example employee owned companies reinvest their wealth those extra monies are not going into the pockets of upper management and the board of directors but the extra money is being reinvested back into the community to me it's about moving away from individualism and possessiveness of the sense of ownership of things and it works better when we share what we have we learned this first in kindergarten and we can still do it
Cool. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to just talk for a few minutes uh, about the film and what it means to me and also what it means to Soil Not Oil. Uh, when we try to think about how the commons, what's maybe one of the first things people would think about before they see the trailer, land. The things that we share that have been enclosed, that have been privatized, that have been told that like a corporation can own the forest. They can own the land, they can patent genes, a lot of things that we are disagreeing with. And this film talks about the paradigm shift, how we move from the idea of privatization or that governments own things to we own things and we should start making decisions together. So when you talk about the commons, we go beyond water and land. We start talking about ideas, how we make decisions, money, uh, and how we can democratically shift a lot of these issues and intertwine movements that our friends agree with, that we are involved with, that um, really uh, is kind of, we, we mainly focus in the United States on, uh, for this film, but it's happening around the world. You know, how do people come together and make decisions together for themselves without an outsider coming in, uh, privatizing or going against that, that hierarchy uh, with a lot of the evil corporations that we see, um, uh, Monsanto and others who are taking away land, uh, destroying the soil, and climate change, going towards the air as a commons. Who's allowed to pollute unlimited into the air without our consent? You know, this is what we're holding on to for the next generations, and we need to give it back to them um, nicer than we found it. So. Uh, I hope you can visit the website. The film is released. It's two hours, and we're looking for people who want to share it with their community, who want to screen it um, in front of audiences who they think are ready to like move from ideas to action. Uh, the film starts with destruction, then it talks about resistance, um, but most of the film is about solutions. And you might have recognized some of these clips. We're going to hacker spaces that are talking about turning the internet into a commons. You know, instead of going from a provider who's private, who can cut you off at any moment, is continually like searching your data, how do you link your Wi-Fi network to create your own internet and share information, especially with emergency preparedness? You know, solar energy and the list goes on and how it can food be a commons, how can land be a commons and be shared especially by the communities that have been living there for the longest to be able to make decisions around it. So thank you very much. I, I'm throwing out a lot of buzzwords that maybe you like, so hopefully check out commonsfilm.com, watch the film, and contact us if you'd like to host a screening. It just got released, and all next year we're going to be touring around the United States, uh, showing it with some of the impacted communities that are in the film, and also all over the place. Thank you so much.